who comes to believe in Jesus soon comes to understand that uh, just because you accept Jesus as your Savior, it's not going to mean that your life is going to be smooth sailing. Right? We, we discover this. Now, there's some teaching and, and some preachers out there that teach us that uh, if you give your heart to Jesus, uh, life is going to go smoothly, provided that you possess enough faith. Now, you know, I think if you live long enough in this world as a believer, you're going to come to a point where you understand that that's not true. And some folks that have taken that doctrine and internalized it, when things begin to get tough, when life, life's waves wash over them, they come to the point where it's almost like they're wondering if God is really who they thought he is. If he really has the power to, um, to intervene in life's circumstances. And I, I've seen people that have taken this path get very discouraged. And, and not only that, but, but there's an awful lot of condemnation that follows suit with that as well. And people are living under this cloud of condemnation, figuring that they, can't, they don't measure up somehow with the Lord. Now, am I saying that God does not supernaturally intervene when we pray? Am I saying that God does not heal people when we ask Him to? No, that's, that's not what I am saying. Okay? There are times when we ask God to intervene and to heal, and he does. And he does it when we have faith in him and we ask him in faith, trusting that he will do the right thing in that circumstance. And when he decides to intervene supernaturally and heal, it's not just to flash something out there. It is for a divine purpose. And when he decides to allow us to bear through things and have a thorn as per se in our flesh then his grace is sufficient for us his strength is perfected in our weakness because those things they they encourage us to trust him even in the midst of life's troubles now in the light of eternity the life that we live here in the body is, is really very short-lived. And, you know, we, we have trials. The Lord's not cruel, my friends. He's not cruel. He wants us to learn dependence on Him. He knows how easily we go astray when things are all rosy all the time. You ever notice that with yourself? When things are you're just going, everything's going perfectly. It's sometimes you turn your attention to the things of this world and, and your heart actually drifts away from God. There's nothing like a little bit of trial in your life to brought, bring you to your knees. You see, God understood all of this when he created us and he put us into the world that we're living in. So, we have challenges physically, but we also face psychological and spiritual challenges. When, when you come to Jesus and you ask him to be your savior, okay, there is an experience where God's spirit comes into your, your spirit and you become one with him. That's what atonement means, that one meant. When you come to Jesus and the spirit of God makes his residence in you. Your values will change. God will change you. And today, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, then, then you're not truly a believer. And you need to come to him today and lay it all down and ask him to be your Savior. Ask him to, to be the Lord of your life. 
But when you become a Christian, your values change. And, and some people are going to hate you because you're committed to civi- serving a holy, righteous God. And you're committed to imitating Him and living out your life in the holy way that He asks of you. Why? Because you come to love Him. And to love Him is to obey Him. And when Jesus comes into you and you love Him, your heart is going to shift and you're going to want to serve Him and you're going to want to love Him back. And when you're in the world and there's people all around you that are not committed to serving God, they're not committed to holy living, their values are going to clash and they're going to be in opposition to ours. Those who love the darkness will be repelled by us. And this repulsion leads to mocking. It's going to lead to persecution because we are in league with Jesus. And because they walk in darkness, they are in league with the enemy of our souls, Satan. Now, as a Christian, part of what I was saying, physically we're going to face trials, but we're also going to face psychological and spiritual trials when people come against us. Remember what Jesus said, though, in Matthew 5, 11 and 12? He said this. He said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And Jesus also said this in John chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. He said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth and comes into the light so that it may be plain, seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So we see we're in the world and we have troubles physically. We have troubles with resistance by people that are walking in darkness. In addition, last week, the last message that I brought to you in Ephesians, we focused our attention on Ephesians 6, and I spoke to you about spiritual warfare. And the reality of it is that people who stand up for Jesus are going to clash with principalities and powers of darkness in this world. You're going to have a war on your hands. You are going to be advancing the kingdom of God and your adversary, the devil, is going to be doing everything he can to throw you off so that you're ineffective and unproductive in the mission that Jesus Christ has called you to. So, we're at war with principalities and powers of darkness actively resisting the mission of God. So as believers... You consider the physical, you consider the psychological, you consider the spiritual things that come against us. It's definitely not smooth sailing out there, is it? It's not smooth sailing. We confront these troubles which make us uncomfortable. So, if physical, psychological, and spiritual comfort were not given to us by God as our lot in this world, What needs to be our focus? We need to be consistently reminded of what God's purpose for us here is. And before coming, let's let's think for a moment. Many of you were raised in Christian families, and you're a Christian as long as you can remember, and you came to know Christ that way. But there's many here that have come out of darkness not knowing Christ, not knowing anything about him, you, there, was, there was that sense of lostness in the dark. And, and those who do not have Jesus in their hearts, you know, they're lost. They're walking in darkness and they're separated from God. 
And, and when they die, they're not going to be with God. They're going to hell. That's a sobering reality. It's a sad reality. Because for those that don't know Jesus, there is no hope for eternity. There's no hope. And at, at one time, those of us who now experience salvation through Christ, we too were lost and without hope. Well, even if you're a child and you don't remember it, what drew you to accept Jesus as your Savior is that realization that you need a Savior. The realization that Jesus Christ loves you and He gave Himself so that you could have salvation and have eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul reminds the believers there. He said, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreign to the covenants of promise, without hope, and without God in the world. But now, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now we've been saved by Jesus. Eternal life has come to us. It starts here and now. The Christian knows that he has eternal life. And this is the testimony. God's given us eternity in our hearts. He's put eternity in our hearts. And this eternal life is through His Son. This is our blessed hope. In John, 1 John 5, 11 and 12, we're told, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, to 6, 4 cha uh, chapter 4, starting with verse 6. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And here we go with our trials. Listen to this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All of this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. You hear that? Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen. Not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. 
since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Do you hear that message? What does that build in us? As believers, our, our eyes have been opened to the truth that's, that sets us free. The truth is that our lives here in the flesh are only temporary. Sometimes we get so worked up about things that aren't going the way we want them to in the flesh. I know it's natural. It's natural for us to gravitate there. But the truth is, saints of Christ, here today, we are everlasting beings. And the truth is that God gives us breath for a time in these temporary tents that we have to give us a choice as to how we're going to live out eternity. You know, at, and think about it. At, at one moment, we're healthy, strong, and full of vitality. And, and the next moment, we're clinging to life by a thread. One moment in time, we're children, and the next moment in time, our own children are all grown up and they're leaving home. And then we become grandparents. I'm going to be a grandparent on January 20th, Lord willing. So I'm real excited about that. But it's a blink. It's a blink in time. And just in a blink of time after that, our health fades as we get older. Time as a child takes forever. You remember as a child, you're looking forward to your birthday or whatever it is, something exciting, and it takes absolutely forever. And when you're old, the days just fly by like, like hours. And, and, and the weeks or the months fly by like weeks. And, and the years fly by like months. It just seems to increase in speed as you get older. We really don't have a whole lot of time here in this world, in this state. We don't have a lot of time to get it sorted out. We love, we work, we play, we cry, and then we die. This is the reality of the broken fleshly vessels that we live in. And we will all stand before the throne of God and have to give an account to the one who judges the living and the dead. All of us. But the good news is that when a Christian dies, death is not final. It's another phase of life, actually. When a believer in Jesus dies, he or she moves immediately into a glorious and eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54, it's written, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and, with the, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Amen. As a result of the rescue mission of God, the rescue mission that he launched to save us through Jesus, we have this glorious hope for the future, a life that will never spoil or fade. And this, what does this give us? This gives us hope. The wonderful plan of God was to establish a close relationship with us here and now. And his desires for that relationship that starts here and now to grow deeper and deeper and deeper all the way through eternity. I don't think we even understand even just a smidgen of how deep and how wide the love of God is. I think it's going to take us an eternity of discovery with him to see. Because he is so awesome and so majestic. <sighs> Sometimes we lose sight of that. Because we're living in this tent here. We put things to our five senses and we put God in a box. It's easy for us to do that. But God wants us 
to trust him in the good times. Trust him in the good times. Trust him in the bad times. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think so often we ride on our feelings rather than on trusting in the unshakable character of our Lord. Right? We let our feelings dictate how we're reacting and God wants us to mature and to grow in our faith so that we're not reacting based on feelings, but we're putting our trust in his word and saying, God, I thank you. We can't do this alone, can we? This is counterintuitive to the flesh that we live in. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, Now it is God who makes us both both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership over us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And it's all because of Jesus that we have this hope for the future. The spirit's been given to us as this deposit. What is to come is simply awesome. Romans 5, 1-6 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, we have gained, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory, hear this, we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces Perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Powerful stuff. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. See, sometimes we just read that verse but we don't look at the context of it. God died just at the right time to reconcile us to himself. And his whole purpose in doing that is to change us, to give us his character and, 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 and build hope in us for eternity. You know, Paul's not spinning out platitudes when he speaks to us about this in Romans 5, I mean, God uses suffering wonderfully in our lives. Real strong and pure character is developed through the fiery trials that we face. And I know as humans we resist this. In our natural state, suffering produces impatience, doesn't it? And impatience misses the fruit of experience. And it sours into hopelessness. That's the natural way. And this hopelessness, it produces irritation and rebellion against God. Questioning, unbelief, and all sorts of evil. But for the true believer who bows the knee of their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ who's been renewed by the Holy Spirit, suffering produces goodness. The byproduct of the fiery trial forged and tempered in, in us builds character. And that character leads to hope. In the context of Romans in, this, in the New Testament here, hope in this verse right here. Hope is the confidence that God will deliver what he has promised. Hope does not disappoint. It doesn't, it doesn't disillusion us. It doesn't leave us hanging. It doesn't disappoint us. Hope implies a level of certainty that we will receive God's goodness forever. And it, it actually builds the bottom line for a Christian's thoughts and emotions. When you trust God and you believe that what He promised will come to pass, 
no matter what comes along in your life, you are going to be fully convinced that your ultimate end will be sharing in the glories of God forever. So leading up to Christmas in 2022 here, the hope of the universe isn't just an idea. Hope of the universe is a person. Hope was what the angels sang about when Jesus was born. The Advent story that we're, we're starting into today is hope because it lays out the story of how our Creator stepped out of His throne room and was born in a little manger in a quaint little town humblest of circumstances. He humbled himself and became obedient to be the Savior for you and for me. Jesus embodies hope for people born into a wicked and weary world. You know that song, the weary world rejoices. For people born into a weary world which is damaged by sin, there simply cannot be any other source of hope. Our education system is not going to solve the problem. New governments, the hope of new governments replacing old bad ones, well, that's not going to bring hope. That's not going to fix the problem. Better laws aren't going to solve the problems. Because of the shackles of sin around people's hearts, well-intentioned people even don't even have the power to affect change to bring about lasting solutions on their own. Much less bring about lasting solutions on a personal level. The inescapable condition of sin affects every single human being on the planet. And it has scarred every aspect of our cosmos, the things that we see around us. And that cosmos even now cries out for divine intervention. All creation groans under the weight. You see, the only solution was a Savior, and the only Savior who possesses the necessary wisdom and power and righteousness to save our planet is God Himself. He came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Jesus came to provide a way for us to escape the corruption of this world caused by evil desires. And he has revealed himself to us. Sitting here today, if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, this has been opened up to you. This is the hope in which you stand. This world cannot take away what God has placed inside of you. The eternity that he's placed in your heart, it doesn't matter how bad it gets here. Paul says, I learned the secret to contentment. Whether it's good whether it's bad, whether it's anything in between. The secret of contentment is this, that Jesus Christ is alive and sitting at the right hand of the Father. And the hope of glory is that one day when we cross the finish line in this race that he set us on, we will see Jesus face to face and he will wipe every tear away from our eyes. And the old order of things will be gone and all things will be made new. This is the message that we need to present out there about Christmas. Christmas is all about hope, and hope is a person in Jesus. Wow. So, he came to suffer. He came to forgive. He did it because he knew that one day sinners will live with him 
as he gather, gathers the wheat into his barn for all of eternity. We celebrate today the eternal hope that's given to us in Jesus. And it's only fitting as we start into this time of remembering the birth of Christ that we also remember why Christ was born. I'm going to ask the fellows that have been asked for communion to come at this time.